Thank you, Allison. Uh, so I'm Kim Stitzel from the American Heart Association. I oversee and co-lead our Center for Health Metrics and Evaluation at AHA. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Um, I have no conflicts to disclose other than I'm an employee of AHA and that's how I get to buy food every day. Um, so, and I'm talking about personalized nutrition. I'm talking about it from the angle of um, the idea that by customizing our nutrition advice, we're hopefully enabling people to successfully make dietary change. And the environment that, um, that the food landscape lives in today is changing dramatically, as we all know. We're helping to shape it. But consumers are driving that change as well. Um, the, they're dri driving the way that food is prepared, packaged, and instantaneously available to them. There is um, growing um, health care incentives to eat healthy as, as the population ages, as chronic disease is, is unfortunately sort of taking a turn. and. Trends are going in um, the opposite of what we'd like to see, or starting to potentially go in the opposite of what we'd like to see. There's more incentives out there for healthcare and insurance companies to want to provide incentives for healthy eating. And then finally, technology, not just about what I'm going to talk about, but the technology about the way we shop, the way we eat. We've got Grubhub. Food can show up at your door within 30 minutes. Um, Amazon has new, gro you know, no lane, no person grocery stores, as well as the online shopping. And you can instantly then have um, fresh food delivered as well. So our whole entire food landscape is changing dramatically. So we need to help people when they're looking to make behavior change also adapt to this new and changing landscape. And so. Why is behavior change important? As I touched on, and I think most of us in this room know, we're um, really bumping up against some potentially scary trends. We've enjoyed for 30 plus years, or at least since the AHA has been monitoring cardiovascular mortality rates, a decline. And we're starting to see some leveling off in different populations, particularly around stroke rates. Um, that's very alarming. And we think some of that is due to the obesity epidemic that's out there. So we need to think about um, how can we prevent those, and we've been talking about this for, gosh, at least 20, 30 years, um, that human behavior and behavior change is one element outside of the environmental landscape um, and the food availability that can enable us to prevent disease in the first place. And this is important because if 80 or 7 out of 10 deaths are happening from modifiable um, risk factors and 40% of that is through behavior change, that is a place eventually we've got to figure out. And we've been exploring this for a long time, and there are some interventions that we're seeing that are working. To level set, um, we wanted to talk about um, what are the key elements of behavior change. And so we are thinking about those people who, um, when you look at different theories of behavior change, we're thinking about folks who are already moving to a stage of they know they need to do something. Um, so they're out of pre-contemplation, they're in contemplation, and they're moving towards um, taking an action. So there are four really important points when you're thinking about or you're working with somebody um, around changing their behaviors. One is, what is the behavior they're trying to say? What is their goal? And then sharing that goal, because the more you share that goal, the more you become committed to that goal. Second aspect of behavior change that's really important is monitoring and tracking. And Claude talked a lot about different ways that um, we can monitor and track our progress. Reinforcement, and this is where behavior change and nudge theory start to come. Um, the right type of message at the right time um, so that um, it's uh, motivating a person to continue down that path to where they're headed. And then ultimately a reward system along each step of the way. How am I giving almost a benefit to myself, treating myself for making a commitment and following through with it? And so technology, you know, what is the technology that can shape that? Claude covered so much of it, so I won't spend a lot of time here. But the one thing I do want to point out when we talk about it from a behavior change and a theory, that is a very fine line with devices and the nudges that you get between motivation and demotivation. So an example of, um, to me, a great nudge is if you have a food journaling app, and this is a case study that I'm going to share with you that we're working on, 
If you te have, if we, if um, the app knows you have always, in you know, provided uh, your food intake for the day, say at nine, noon, three, and six. If it's 12:30 and there's been no data input into the app, the app should send you a little nudge like, "Hey, did you eat lunch? You know, what did you eat?" That could be motivating. Um, for me personally, I've gotten a demotivating um, nudge from my fitness app after I twisted an ankle and couldn't run, and it says, hey, you haven't run today, and you're thinking to yourself, I can't freaking run today. So that's very frustrating, and I deleted the app. So you have to be really careful um, about what is motivating and demotivating. And historically, um, where we are in this space right now is that a lot of technology companies and great mathematicians and data scientists and have been working and developing these really cool, slick and fancy apps. And on the side, we've been over here trying to figure out behavior change theory. Now we're finally all kind of coming together and working together. And now we're starting to develop a little bit of an evidence base of what possibly might work in there. Okay, so what, uh, there's a few highlights that I wanted to share um, across some studies that we looked at. And ultimately, um, at the end of the day, what we've learned is, okay, people track better um, or mon you know, their food intake when they are using an app, and this is of course on the condition that the app is slick, it's easy, and it's an enjoyable to use. So they t tend to track better if it's an enjoyable experience, and they actually enjoy doing it. So that in turn causes them to track more. When you add on top of the tracking a social component, so for example, in one study, um, there was a face group of all the folks who were trying to lower sodium in their diet. So they had some connectivity with other people like them that were trying to have a, you know, do this similar type of behavior. And so they can motivate each other and share their struggles. On top of that, if you add prompts, like I just mentioned, um, hey, I uh, saw that you had a burger today that had a lot of salt. How about you try a banana later on? Or probably something a little bit more fun. I'm a dietitian. I can't help it. I eat salt. I eat a banana afterwards. Um, but the feedback loop of giving them a nudge. So if you have the app, you have the social network, you have the feedback loop, and you have the nudge, we think you're getting more successful. And then finally, the biggest success tends to be if you, on top of that, add something personal like counseling, human interaction on top of that. So human interaction plus the technology that has all those other components seems to be the most successful moving forward from the limited data that's out there today. So we've talked about um, artificial intelligence and AI, and I think everyone gets you know, the concept of it. But we thought it would just be helpful to say AI is that grand umbrella term when we're talking about sort of computer science and intelligent machines. Um, we use these terms all interchangeably between AI and machine learning, but machine learning is just one element of AI. Um, similarly, Predictive analytics is also one element of AI. Um, so I guess it's sort of like the, con, uh, the, the comparison that a rectangle is a square, but a square is not a rectangle. So um, before I, you know, I go into our case study of our food journaling um, app that we're developing, so we looked at um, you know, what is the latest science telling us um, about how digital applications can um, uh, impact behavior change positively? What are the core elements of behavior change? We wanted to look at what are the trends that are happening out in this field, in this space that we want to be in. And one is that we see the, that traditional, we have a prediction that um, with the invention of Siri, Echo, Google Home, and more and more of these voice-enabled speech recognition programs, that the traditional way of communicating, typing, websites, is starting to decline, and more often we're going to be using these voice-enabled technologies to get us the information that we want. And speech recognition is one form of artificial intelligence. So an example, oh, sorry, and so we see that tipping point being in about 2020 to 2025 where we think voice enabled. So that's a function that we wanted to make sure is included in our app. So in a real live example of kind of these tipping points, how many people still have a landline in their house? Who thinks they'll still have that landline in their house in five years? 
So, good example. So, back in 2004, that's when Apple released the iPhone. And that's when smartphones started to come into the marketplace. And it took us all many years before we had one, but I think almost everybody has a smartphone these days. And so the tipping point took about 12 years before smartphone technology took up um, the space of landline technology. And when I looked around the room, it was probably about 10% of you still have landlines. We didn't pull this all the way out to 2018, but you'll see it dive pretty fast. The other trend, um, uh, the trend that goes on top of the speech recognition is this idea of um, the conversational interface. So how it works is bot technology is essentially just um, an application or software that um, is designed to simulate a conversation with human users. Um, and especially over the internet. So for example, when you go on AT&T and you can't figure out how to pay your bill or you can't remember your password and that little box comes up and says, hey, I'm Susie, I'm here to help you. What can I help you with? That's not Susie. That's Susie the robot, you know, the chat bot. And Susie the chat bot knows the answers over history to about a hundred, you know, hundreds and hundreds of questions and learns those answers over time. That is AI technology, that is machine learning and speech recognition coming together. There is no one on that other end until you get to a point where Susie, that chatbot, doesn't have enough data to anticipate an action and then maybe, if you're lucky, Susie will actually turn you over to a real Susie. <laughs> a living, breathing Susie. But this chatbot technology is growing more and more. People love it. Um, they expect it now from their um, any company or interface that they're working with. Um, and just some data for it um, is 35 explicitly want chatbots. They don't really want real people. Um, and of those folks, about 70% of them um, like it because it's instantaneous. We are in an instant world. And even more so, um, a, you know, a fifth of those uh, think it's the best way to communicate with a company. So I think it's, it's a really smart technology. It feels really good. People like it. It's something we want to include in ours as well. So how did we come up with um, what I'm about to present to you? We looked out in the marketplace, and our goal was really to identify a tool that makes it easy for average people to adopt a few healthy habits. And this was specific to the area of, of diet. We did a landscape review of what's out there um, and where should we be looking for, you know, whatever it is that's out there. And so um, I'll share on the next slide what criteria we used in literature and we talked to a few folks to what they find. But it probably won't surprise you as being the science side of the house that we couldn't find in any apps out there um, that are in the marketplace. We know people are developing, but we couldn't find any out there that really combined all of the science-based strategies and the behavior science that we know to be true um, with a really nice, clean user experience that incorporates then all of that behavioral science that we know is, Im is important. You need that. Um, reward loop system to be built into that, um, and it needs to feel seamless, like it can't feel contrived or um, uh, like a robot actually, it has to feel very human, and so someone has to have, you start to get an emotional engagement. Um, I don't know if any of you, I, I feel this more in the fitness side, if anyone is a runner or a walker, all I know is I'm very frustrated if I forgot to turn that on and I don't get credit for that walk or that move. It feels like I never even went for that ran at all. And so I'm you know, quickly scurrying to like manually enter it, but somehow it feels like cheating. It doesn't feel the same as when it captured it the whole time. Frankly, I don't know that me interacting it isn't more specific and accurate than what the tool is actually picking up from my activity, but I'm so emotionally engaged now with it, I like, can't not have it. That's exactly what you want from an app. Um, and then does it have a setback recover routine to that point of, it? You know, maybe I haven't turned the app on in a day or two or haven't interacted. Does it come back around and say like, hey, don't forget me out here. You said you wanted to eat more fruits and vegetables and there's a, si a shiny little apple over there. Turn me on, track it, and let's eat it. Let's go. It's got to be able to do that. Um, and then we also talk to different experts out there just in case we couldn't you know, couldn't find anything out there, you know, did people know of anything out there, and we couldn't find anything that was already developed and out there. Um, so I'm going to share with you sort of our 
um, case study around our speech recognition food journaling um, app that we have in development right now. So here's how it kind of works. So again, like I said, we're, we're targeting a person who is already knows they need to make a change and is, is motivated to do that. So the person comes in, um, decides that they need to set goals and they need to monitor, track, journal their eating. And the thing we know we need to be is almost device agnostic. Um, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into only one stream, one format. Um, so the application that we're developing can be, you can enter it through social media, you can use it through an actual mobile app, or through um, uh, an a, a voice app that can sit within, say, Siri or Echo Alexa. Um, so you can come in any way, so it's uh, agnostic. Then the user can sign up, set goals, and um, input the foods that they've eaten throughout the day through a variety of ways. Claude mentioned pictures and visual, you know, uh, being able to enter food that way. I mean, we can say, hey Siri, I just had a peanut butter sandwich, two slices of bread, I don't know about the size of a fist of peanut butter, um, and that's what I had for lunch. So you can give it as much information as you can, or you can hand type it in. So pictures, voice, or hands. Um, and, and we will, and one of the things we are exploring as well is, and I think, uh, Claude, you presented this, was the idea of, um, or maybe it was Mads and his research, shopping. And can we, you know, look at how when you're buying something and scanning it, is that also another piece that we can add into here? Um, so anyway, we want the person to be able to continuously update wherever they are and they have time. So you need to be able to transition among the devices. So maybe when on my way to work, because I eat in the car, um, I might say, hey, watch, I, um, I had a Cliff peanut butter bar. And then I might be eating my lunch at, desk, at my desk, and so I can, you know, talk to my computer and tell my computer what I did. So you want to be able to let it uh, continue to update wherever you are and wherever you have time, easy frictionless. So here's where you want the recommendation engine, that personalized nutrition, that personalized feedback to come in. It can either be motivating messages for what you should do next. It could be, hey, your goal was to do, um, to eat less, you know, sodium and you're, you were goal to 2300. We see you're already at 2000 for dinner. You know, you, maybe this is a suggestion of what you could eat for dinner. So it can either nudge you to what you should be doing, um, nudge you towards um, maybe data you missed inputting. It may, you know, it can give you um, a message as to what to eat. It can be very flexible within the system to tell you, and it's going to learn over time. If I um, if I tell Allison that. Um, it, uh, what would be really great for you is to have some whole grain bread, and I've offered that to you twice, and you've never taken it and eaten it. I'm going to stop saying eat whole grain bread. Um, I'm going to—it's going to tell you to do something else. So it really should have sort of brains inside of it to be thinking. Of, I told you that hmm, that didn't work. Well, I'm going to try in something else. Um, and then ultimately, what you're driving towards is that deeper, deeper, deeper engagement. And then ultimately, what we're hoping is you're changing your behavior and will have positive outcomes, which is why AHA cares about it. <laughs> we're hoping in the end of the day, we're gonna finally figure out how we can get people to eat healthier. Oop, and have a healthy heart. And it beats very well, I guess, when <laughs> it's healthy. Um, so our next steps are, we're still in a build stage. Um, if you've ever built this kind of technology, you kind of bootstrap it together, um, and you kind of pretend function it around, and then you actually build it. We're at the point now where we're um, building the technology right now to pilot it. Um, one of the great things that AHA can do, because we have so many of our programs, we can push apps out to, for example, say, our Go Red for women database and have them sign up and be test users. So it's a kind of a really easy way that we have we have cadres of people who have raised their hands and say, we're ready to play for whatever you have. Um, so we have kind of users that we can go out to and, and test out our pilot. We're going to validate it, of course, for um, accuracy, for specificity, for sensitivity. You know, are we really? I mean, are, is it really even capturing what people are eating? Um, one, of, you know, one way to do that, for example, is if we pull it off into a small pilot study where we, you could do 24-hour um, sodium 
uh, urine sodium samples to just test back to say is what that food, you know, what that person entered, was that valid? That's one way to test that, for example. And then we're going to look at, our, you know, is the behavior science machine working? Are people actually doing why or why not? And then did they like it? I mean, the heart, that's actually the first part is that user experience. Is it slick? Is it frictionless? Um, you know, is it my friend on my wrist? Does it feel like I have a little buddy with me wherever I go? Or is it annoying? <laughs> and I just wanted to take the watch off and throw it. So we'll be working on the user experience. The other thing is natural language processing technology is evolving very quickly in a positive way. There are some accents, there are some tones of voices that speech recognition and that, um, and that language has, uh, is still a little tricky as it's learning. I think you know, we anticipate those bugs are going to be worked out over the next year or two, and that's when we see ourselves really probably coming to market um, with this. So we need to make sure we're, we include all of that um, technology evolution along it. So we think um, you know, behavior change is absolutely necessary to improve health and lower health care costs. That's, that's the why. Um, and we're finally, I feel like technology companies are partnering with us here in the room our, as the scientists who actually know what should be done. So I think that's really excited. So there's new applications, there, and they're emerging. Um, but we really still need to understand you know, how they're working, the accuracy of the information they're collecting, all of the feedback systems. Um, and I'm hoping Claude and his company can continue to create lots and lots of more monitoring systems that are, um, that are accurate, that will help us with those feedback loops. And really understand how are they working with all the other interventions, the changes in the environment and the foodscape that we're trying to accomplish, when it's being paired with that human interaction and the registered dietitian or your physician and medical nutrition therapy and electronic records. And then really understanding who is that right target for these technologies. We are under no assumption that this is where we're going to go um, to solve social determinants of health and you know folks that have other issues going on. We know that this is a specific market, a specific audience, and a group that we're working on. So, but we need to make sure we are getting those right people and we're targeting them correctly. Oop. There we go. Thank you very much.